morning and welcome to day two of Festival of the Future. It's really good to have you here and apologies for the slight delay and getting going this morning, but we are live here and we are, you know, really pushing the, the limits of technology to do this. So thanks for waiting and uh, we're going to have a, a fantastic morning. You will be rewarded for your patience. I'm also a really big welcome to our live audience here in Ferndown and uh, we're really looking forward to, to what's going to be going on. So my name's Thomas. I work for Dorset Council and spend my time thinking around uh, ways uh, to help children and families in Dorset really thrive uh, and live their best lives. And joining me, I've got two fantastic co-presenters. Firstly, welcome, Amy. Thank you very much. So, Amy, who are you? Tell us what do you do in your day job. My name's Amy. I work for Talk Think Do, who is sponsoring this event today and for the rest of the week. And uh, on, in terms of my average day, I'm a PMO analyst, which is a nice and quick way to say a project management office analyst. Yeah, really quick and catch you that one. But yeah. fantastic. It's great to have you joining us today. And then secondly, just breaking every stereotype of what a librarian should look like, please welcome Dan. Dan, tell us who you are. So I'm the apprentice at Gillingham Library and I've been working there since July and I've been really enjoying my time. I've been working really closely with the digital champions to help get this digital alpha to our public. Great. Good. Really good to have you here. And we're going to be exploring lots of things over the next while. But where are we today? Where is this beautiful sunny place in Dorset? Well, I can tell you that we are broadcasting live from Ferndown next to, and you can see behind me, Parley Common. But actually, more importantly, we're in a vibrant and colourful community called Trickett's Cross. And right at the heart of that community is this wonderful centre that we're going to be exploring today. Uh, it's a building owned by Dorset Council, but operated by a community interest company who had really... Um, set right at the heart of this community doing brilliant, brilliant work to, to help uh, the families and residents of this area uh, live their best lives too. So we're going to be uh, finding out a bit more about that later on and finding out how this building will be part of Dorset Council's Family Hub Network too. So that's going to be good. And there's lots of other innovation happening all around East Dorset and Ferndown too. And we're going to be taking on quite a journey to explore some of those bits and pieces together. Funny you should say that because on my way here this morning I spotted a new cycleway and I'm looking forward to hearing a lot more about what made the council invest in that. What are you looking forward to Daniel? Well recently we had Dorset's first ever coding day and I'm really looking forward to watching the video of that event to see how it went at the different venues. And I read actually there was 2,000 children that came to that, is that right? Yeah it was really incredible and some of them were even at Gillingham Library where I work and it was great to be able to offer that. Right. Yeah, some of the developers from Talk Think Do were getting involved in that too. We're going to be coming back to that later. Sounds good. So lots and lots of stuff for you guys to see and to watch online, but actually you can get involved too, and there's a few ways you can do that. So obviously you're probably watching on YouTube, so do use the comments section to ask us some questions which we can interact with, and just let us know uh, what you think as well. And if you're on social media, do use the hashtag FutureFest22 uh, and interact with us as we go. Well, I'm off to get a cup of tea, so I'm going to leave it over to you, Amy, to tell us what's happening next. Yeah, sounds good. So, first off, we're going to say hello to my former lecturer from Bournemouth University. Hello. Do you want to grab that? Yes. <laughs> um, so, this is Dr. Phil Wilkinson from Bournemouth University and one of his current students, Phoebe Ashling. Hello. Who, so, Phil is... Um, a senior lecturer in communications. Phoebe, what are you studying? I am actually currently a third year student in communication media, so Phil's degree. Yeah, and she's doing really well. <laughs> That's so good far. To hear. <laughs> That's good to hear. I also studied back home, actually, at Bournemouth University, and Phil was also my lecturer. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a fun way to see everyone in one place. Yeah, nice like thing a reunion. Of past, present, and future. Oh, yeah. back on and <laughs> Bournemouth University. Thank yeah, you. exactly. Um, so, Phil, what activity are you doing today? Uh, well, I have some uh, bullying kids from Ferndown First School today with me, and we are doing stop motion animation with them, which is this really cool uh, activity where they get to be creative and design their props and come up with their stories. It's going to be Halloween themed because it's October, and then they have to do the technical production skills of filming and editing and adding sound and, and that kind of thing. So it's a real interesting mixed uh, set of skills that they're, that they're demonstrating today. It's the perfect group of skills to get them ready for a media degree. Yeah. My future students. <laughs> Amazing. So, Phoebe, 
Um, you're getting involved with this event for the whole week, aren't you? And I think yes. yesterday I saw you operating the camera. I was. I was actually in charge of the camera inside, which was a very exciting experience, mainly because I got to do it inside and not in the field. As lovely and sunny as it was, it was a little bit more relaxed for me. But I'm actually going to be doing all sorts throughout the festival today. I'm helping Phil with the stop motion, but I'm going to be doing some on-camera work, some filming. It's all very exciting, and I can't wait to get stuck in. Amazing. It's great to hear that you're getting involved in work experience and seizing the opportunities whenever they come along. I look forward to catching up with you guys later and hearing about the activity you've got on with. Super. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amy. Well, that sounds like an excellent activity for the kids, but we've got to have something for the adults here today too. And that's where I'm joined with Lindsay and Julie. What can you tell us about what you've got going on today, Lindsay? Hi, Daniel. Good morning. Um, we are here with some of our digital champions. They are volunteers who work in libraries and other community centres and settings. And uh, they help people. Last month, they helped 146 um, people. Um, and it averages about 140 a month uh, all over the county. So we've got some of them here with us today. And they're here to help people with any digital queries they might have. That's a really great and quite frankly excellent offer. And we've got Julie here, who's one of those lovely people. And I think she's going to tell you a little bit more about what she does in her job. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, my fellow digital champions and I offer support helping people uh, with their computers, with their smartphones, with their uh, mobile devices. Um, and we see learners sort of across the complete spectrum. We get uh, people who are complete beginners, never touched a keyboard in their life, uh, through to people who've just got a new smartphone, a new tablet, and they want to know more uh, about how it works. Um, and a lot of people uh, don't realize how much they can get out of those devices. Um, you know, you can uh, surf the net and send emails, but there's a lot more. So um, the one thing that all of our learners have in common is a desire to learn more, and that's why we're here. We're here to help them, and hopefully we will see people today who we can help. That's fantastic, and I hope that some of the people here today do get that help that they need. Now it's back over to Amy, who's going to tell you some more about this cycleway she spotted. Thanks, Daniel. Yes, I'm here in the car park at the centre, and I'm hoping someone, ah, oh, look, uh, is going to tell me about this new cycleway. I'm just going to grab a mic for them. Um, so, this is, uh, you're coming to the Festival of the Future, right, to tell us about some bikes, I believe? That's right. Um, and I'm looking for someone named Chris. That's yes. us. Yeah. That's us, both of us. Amazing. So, do either of you know something about the cycleway? I think I'm the person to speak to about the cycleway. Um, the other Chris is more about the bikes. Amazing. Um, T tell me all about it. So across the whole of uh, Ferndown and Wimborne, we've been building a, a big network of cycle link infrastructure at the moment. As anyone who lives around here will know and has seen the amount of roadworks, it's been pretty disruptive, but the end is in sight. And once it's finished, we'll have about 20 kilometers of new cycle infrastructure, which is also good for people walking in wheelchairs, scooting. It's not just about cycling. Amazing. And I think I heard that there's quite a lot of money and investment coming into that, isn't there? Where did that come from? So, yeah, we've got, uh, along with BCP counts, we've got £79 million pounds to spend on this. That's for bus infrastructure and for these cycle, infra cycle infrastructure as well. And as part of that, we've also got some sensors where we're using to monitor what's happening on a day-to-day -day level across the network. That tells us exactly what's happening. I think we've got a clip to show as well. Yeah. So, um, we're going to go and take a look at that video. I'm Chris Peck, I'm the Principal Transport Planner, I'm the Principal Transport Planner at Dorset Council. So we're in Burndown, so th the problem we have here is, is way too much traffic on our streets as we all know. And what we're trying to find is an alternative means for people to get around and make those short trips. We have a, a huge programme of works ongoing to build a, a series of improvements for pedestrians, cyclists, mobility scooter users, wheelchair users 
throughout the whole of the Ferndown area. So what we've got here is we've got sensors on a few of our junctions which tell us exactly which users are using the junction at the moment. Whether that's vehicles, lorries, bikes, motorbikes, pedestrians, and it breaks down by hour, by minute, how many users are going through the junction. And this really helps us inform the design of any future redesign of these schemes or any future layout of the, the road and also helps build a financial case for getting funding for these schemes. But in future, this sort of technology could be used to help make traffic lights smarter, to do all sorts of other things, to look at road user behaviour, many, many things this uh, technology could be used for in the future. So these sensors are part of a scheme to build about 12 miles of cycleways and better footways and better bus provision throughout the whole of Wimbledon and Ferndown. Uh, and as anyone who lives in Ferndown will know, there's been a lot of works going on in Ferndown over the last couple of years. Um, uh, but all this is creating a better, safer road environment to support more trips to be made on foot and by bike. We know, for instance, that the schools in Ferndown, there's almost 2,000 pupils who go to the schools. 750 of them are driven to school, which is much higher than most other parts of Dorset. If we could reduce some of those 750, we'd have much better, smoother traffic in town, much healthier population. So the other big thing, obviously, in Ferndown is the Ferndown Industrial Estate. There's about 4,500 people who commute to Ferndown Industrial Estate, 90% of whom drive. Even though a big chunk of those commuters, about a third of them, are coming from somewhere else quite close to the, the industrial estate. They're coming from Burndown, they're coming from Wimborne, they're coming from West Harley. About 50% of the people also come from Bournemouth or Poole. And there we're building, along with BCP Council, a network of routes to enable some people, not everyone, to be able to cycle those, those trips to the Ferndown Industrial Estate, um, which will have a huge impact on the, the amount of congestion in Ferndown, which everyone knows can be pretty bad uh, during the working day. So one of the things they did use these sensors for elsewhere in the country during the COVID-19 pandemic was to actually identify how many people were socially distancing on the street because it can identify each pedestrian and see how far apart they are from one another so they could see how many close interactions there would be in certain spaces compared to other places. And those sorts of road user behaviour could be monitored safely, anonymously using this technology potentially in the future. So we've got these sensors in several other parts of Dorset, we've got them in Shaftesbury, we've got them in Weymouth and we've got them in Dorchester as well as Ferndown. The idea behind all this technology, all these new routes, all these new things we're doing is to create a, a cleaner, healthier society and better towns that people want to walk in more, cycle in more, you know, get around on, on wheelchairs more safely. And that, and be able to use their cars less. So, yeah, the idea of this is is to really help build a future which is is, is better, better towns that people want to live in. That was a really informative video, Chris. Um, so, you think by changing the layout of the road that will change people's behaviour, won't it? That's the evidence we've seen in, in place. We've already finished bits of this network. So, in Wimborne on the line road cycleway we've put in. It doesn't connect to the full network yet because we're still building it. But there we've seen a doubling in cycle use just in the, since we put in that infrastructure. So we know there's a latent demand there. If we build it, people will start shifting. And some of those trips to the school, we know can be easily moved from being short car trips to being you know, easy bike trips for many people or indeed safer walking trips once we be put better crossings in as well. Amazing. So how many people commute to work by bike or foot currently? So at the moment, across the whole of the Dorset Council area, we know there's about 4,000 people who commute by bike and about 20,000 who walk. Now, if we were Cambridge, say, or the Netherlands, with the leading bike nations or bike places in, yeah. in the country, we, you know, we'd see double that number. And that would be saving about 2,700 tonnes of CO2 per year. And also, there would be huge health benefits from people being more physically active, worth about £8.7 million a year. So these are all the, the benefits we can get if we get a really good infrastructure for people on foot and by bike across the whole of Dorset. But focusing, firstly, where we're starting in Ferndown and Wimborne. Amazing. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, what else is being done to encourage people to change gear and adopt? 
uh, more sustainable forms of transport. I think uh, you're going to tell us a bit about bell bikes, aren't you, Chris? Why are they called bell bikes? So they're named after uh, Beryl Burton, who was a, a, a great uh, female cyclist, um, won almost 100 uh, titles back in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, but also, apparently, Beryl is a, a semi-precious stone, and it, the bikes have got a very similar colour to that uh, that precious stone. So, a couple, couple of reasons why it's called Beryl. Amazing. Thanks, Chris. She sounds really cool. Um, we've got a few questions, I'm told, from people online or in the audience. So the question, I think, was about whether the data from the census is in real time and whether the public can, can see it. So at the moment, um, we do get access to the data uh, in real time and we can view it at, at all times and we can use it to, to actively kind of study what's going on right now and you can get a, a, a shot, as you saw in the clip, of exactly the movements of people um, in the street. We, it's not publicly available at the moment because um, we don't have a means of getting out to the public, but we can certainly um, look in the future at making a, a dashboard or something to, to show what the, sort of the hourly counts are by different modes in different places. So, yeah, we'll be certainly looking into that. Uh, yeah, so th these sensors are their cameras, but there's also, a, I think there's an infrared camera as well. And behind it is a, a bit of um, AI or machine learning, whereby it um, identifies, the computer identifies each of the, the different shapes within the, the screen um, image and, and has worked out that one's a pedestrian, one's a cyclist. And, you know, we, we are pretty confident that it's, it's accurate. We've tested it, we've calibrated it, and it's about 98% accurate. Uh, and is you know you you look at the data and it's it definitely bears out what's what's happening on the street. So it's a pretty clever piece of technology. Is that it on questions? <laughs> so why don't we bring back the horse and cart? Well, you know that's certainly sustainable transport in some respects. But um, you know as as we know from the history of of technology when. When the car first came along in the early uh, 20th century, late 19th century, everyone thought this was the great environmental solution because the problem then was the amount of horse dung blocking up our streets. Now, of course, we're, we're kind of going the next step. We're thinking about electric cars, we're thinking about bikes. Um, so, you know, things have moved on. But certainly the horse and car, it's an, it's an idea, but it did have its own environmental problems. Indeed, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, indeed, like horse, horse dung can be used, but uh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So, we are going to find out a bit more about the centre and where we're based here today. So, I'm going to hand over to Thomas. Hi, welcome. <coughs> so, for all intents and purposes, you're watching at home, probably thinking, why are we spending a whole day in a car park? But I can assure you, behind the camera is this most fantastic centre. So, it's, it's, uh, it's a building owned by Dorset Council and it's operated. Uh, by the centre and it's a community interest company and it really is uh, the hub of this community and uh, one of the managers of the centre is Nikki who's joining me here today. Welcome Nikki, thank you so much for, for letting us hang out here for today and you brought the sun with us and everything which is good. So just tell us a little bit more, what's, what's, what's the centre all about, what's the vision, what, what, what difference does it make for families and, and people in this, in this community? Well the centre opened in... Grab your microphone so yeah. we can hear you. Thank you, sorry. You want to hear this, I assure The centre opened in 2019 after a £750,000 refurbishment. And it started getting really busy. Um, hall hire, so the community can hire our halls. But also we have citizens' advice here. We have other agencies as well. We have the NHS that operate upstairs. And you can hire your hall for absolutely anything. Um, unfortunately, obviously, January, February, March 2020, we had to close due to COVID. Um, and with the community centre being one of the first to close and the last to reopen, 
We started off by going on social media and we found a lot of parents were looking for toddler groups and things to start um, bringing their children to. And so the first week that we opened, we, that we could open, we uh, started a toddler group and we'd run it alongside uh, the NHS weigh-in. So families are entering all the time. We have lots of other services here as well. I've already mentioned Citizens Advice, which are getting busier and busier. And also we have uh, like Dorset Mines and CAMS that all visit the centre and see and support families in the local area. Great. I, mean, I think one of the things I really love, and I've, I've come here quite a lot, is the fact that there's, it, there's a kind of real life and vibrancy and welcome about the place. So you've got all those different groups and different families and different um, citizens who, who live around here coming and mixing, mingling in the space. And sometimes like, the kind of magic almost feels not what's kind of going on the building, but where the things clash, I guess, in the corridor and people then spend time. Yeah. I mean, how have, you, how have you kind of worked to make sure it feels more than just the sum of its parts, but really feels like this kind of hub in a community? Well, we provide, uh, hopefully, as, as far as we can, we, we do provide what the community wants. So, um, but sometimes it's just through networking. It's just through talking to people who come in and sit and have a coffee. They could have been for a walk over the heath. They could have come in because um, they, they were going elsewhere. And they just come in and we start chatting and finding out what they actually want. So it's about building that relationship with the local community. We're very lucky here that we have the nursery next door. So Hopscotch Preschool is next door, which has 160 places for children. And Lorraine, who is my co-director, she knows an awful lot of the families on the estate. So if they're in crisis, if they need anything, they tend to come in and uh, speak to us directly. Yeah, fantastic. Good. And it really is, it really is a, you really feel that sense of relationship when you, when you come here as well as just a really lovely environment. And I can assure you, a bit later on in, in, in this morning's stream, you will get a chance to, to have a look around inside and just see what a great centre it is. So I imagine there's people watching this would love to come and perhaps access some of the stuff that's happening here, or actually even run one of their groups from here. What's, how can people kind of find out more and book space and, and that sort of stuff? We have a website which details all the rooms that we have available. So we have five rooms for hire. Um, one of our rooms uh, is split in two, but if you had a party or you wanted a larger conference, it's dividing doors that can open up and hold 120 people. So all you need to do is give Joseph, who's our uh, duty officer, a call or go onto our website and there is a form that you can fill out and we'll get back to you and let you know. Otherwise, just pop down, come in and see us, come and see what we're all about. You're always welcome. Fantastic. And I guess... In some senses, this, this really is, is, is a, bit of a, a bit of a hub for this, this community and, and particularly for families, would you say, here? In, Absolutely. In, in we, are, we already feel that we're a family hub because of the amount of um, activities and everything that goes on here. We have things like everything from, from yoga, we have jitsu, we've got other martial arts, we've got um, Irish dancing, we have cheerleading, we have U3A, who you will have seen today, coming in and out. Talk to them. Yep. And um, we also have Age Concern and Prama that are working from here as well. So to us, we are already a family hub covering all areas. Fantastic. So there we go. If you're concerned about your age and want to do uh, martial arts, this is the perfect place to go. So, but you mentioned there um, it's already a family hub. And actually, we wanted to talk a bit about family hubs Today. So at this point, I'm going to invite uh, the Executive Director for Children's Services, Dorset Council, Theresa Levy, uh, to join us. And, and, and Family Hubs really is, is part of a kind of national, but certainly we're reflecting here, Dorset uh, initiative um, to, to really provide the right help at the right time for, for children and families across Dorset. And why is that important, Theresa? Thank you, Thomas. And, and it's fabulous to be here in this fabulous weather and this incredible environment which absolutely, as Nikki says, is already really displaying that family hub approach where we want all of our families, irrespective of their age or need, to be able to get help quickly across our county. It's so important that families can receive the support they need. All of us, we know maybe when we're having our first babies or when our children are first turning to be teenagers or when we're heading towards that space of having elder family members who need our support. We need help at the right time, and that right time is often very quickly. It's, it's really important for us that not only do we have places, so this, this place that is it's owned by Dorset Council, but run in partnership with 
these fabulous people who are running the centre and hopscotch is an incredibly important part of that. But we want to have places like this all over our county. But we also know that for many of our communities, and that's not just physical communities, but young people online, families online, they want to access help outside of opening hours of a building. And so that's really important that when families, you know, I remember, it's a long time ago, but I remember when, you know, those first babies and getting everything settled down and feeling confident about feeding or feeling confident about something that you might be worried about. We know lots and lots of families now turn to the internet, turn to a digital offer for that. And we want to make sure that increasingly we're offering a really good digital offer to those families too, to be able to answer those difficult to ask questions, difficult to ask in person, or to be able to really access live support at that time. Yeah, I think that's really important because families are telling us, aren't they, that they want to be able to do more online. They don't want just to go and just find information, but actually they want to complete the thing they set out to do online. And I think that's important because often, again, that right help at that right time might be 11 o'clock on a Sunday night. Mm. Uh, and actually you can access that, that stuff, stuff there and then. So, yeah, really interesting that we're kind of looking both in terms of places and spaces. And I guess there's that middle ground as well because we know uh, in Dorset, as there are many communities, that actually... Um, not everyone has access to suitable broadband or perhaps the skills to use online spaces. So we're really thinking, aren't we, in terms of uh, how family hubs can be a place where uh, to help families, uh, support them to get online and access not only services and things that are there for families, but that kind of wider piece in terms of but for other things that are online as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think being able to be confident to be able to access that digital space is really important. So we've committed to train every single one of our children's services staff in being a digital champion so that wherever they come across people, they can absolutely provide that support. I think it's so important to families that they can be able to get the help they need, sometimes almost more anonymously than they need to coming into a building or a place. And that digital offer offers them that chance. But we know, that particularly in these times when families' budgets are so under pressure, that sometimes having the equipment is a challenge. So, again, being able to have a place where they can come in, access that help, access that support. I mean, some of the things that we know families use that digital platform for already are incredibly important. You know, being able to just check in during COVID whether behaviours that they were seeing in their children were ordinary was really important to our families. So having actually some helplines that we've also set up in part of our service provision means that very often we were just able to have a conversation with families and say, well, I don't know, how should a 13-year-old respond to a global pandemic? You know, at that point, probably anything was going to be within the ordinary sphere, really. So... We know that actually getting that support from others, being able to be in those kind of organised chat rooms, being able to think together about how might I manage these difficult behaviours that I'm experiencing either in myself or in others is absolutely where we want to be. So, Theresa, you've talked... Um, well, Nikki talked about this already in some ways being a family hub. What, um, what do you see that's going to be different when we make this building part of that family hub network? What, additional, or what additionality will there be from a, a kind of centre like this for this community here in Trickett's Cross? I think what's really important to me, and I know it's important to Nikki and Lorraine here too, is that all of our community feel that this is for them. This isn't around... Um, I think what we saw with the Children's Centre movement was very much a sense of it being for tiny babies and little people. Well, that's certainly what family hubs are for, and it's been lovely to see some very tiny babies here today. It's always a pleasure. Um, best start in life is incredibly important to us. But actually, families don't live in those sort of categorizations, and they grow up and they, they have complex needs and complex family arrangements. So that real intergenerational, young people, older people together, that for me will be a really important outcome when we look across all of our family hubs, that people are working in that way. And actually, some families, we know, will have more complex needs. And history told us that often those families didn't access children's centers. What we know is that we want those families to be able to access the support and help just as much as families with, with the lower level needs. So it, it's a more complex requirement. It's more important than ever that we have our staff working in an integrated fashion with staff here. But that's what's going to be so essential. You know, the, the, the movement of staff working differently following COVID is very often my staff will tell me they're, they're highly disinterested in having a desk anymore. They want a place to be with their families where they can work together be together and be close. So this is, again, the opportunity for us with the Family Hubs movement across Dorset is that we can do that. It's a very big national policy. It's a real part of that policy around best start in life 
and families getting help at the right time in the right place, in a place where they feel safe and comfortable. And, and too often, you know, lo lots of our work obviously goes on in families' homes. That will continue. But in, equ equally, we don't want families having their support in an office building, but much more in a kind of warm and friendly environment such as this. So it feels like it's going to be a great fit with somewhere uh, like this here at the centre because of, I guess, that relationship-based approach, that trusted uh, integration with, with the community here. Nikki, I'm kind of thinking from your perspective as someone that is, you know, a leader in this, in this community, um, what difference do you think it will make uh, uh, the centre becoming part of that family hub network? For us, it's about ensuring that um, the centre has the people available for the local community at that time. So we want it to be a one-stop shop basically, so that if you've got an issue, you can come through the door, you can talk, we can either sort it there and then, or we can signpost you on to other agencies. The beauty of it being in the centre in the community is nobody knows why you're walking through that door. You could be walking through the door to go to a yoga class or an art class or anything, but actually your real reason might be for a food bank. It could be for a clothes bank, but nobody knows that. That's very different. You might have a meeting with a social worker here, and that's very different from going into Ferndown and walking into social care offices and thinking, oh, everybody knows where I'm going. So for us, it's about it being a one-stop shop. Excellent. Great. And I think, you know, we are, this is kind of the early days of the Family Hub Network for us, and the centre here in Ferndale will be one of the, the first Family Hubs to go live in Dorset, but we are looking very much in terms of what that means for the whole uh, county. But we're also thinking around how we can use these spaces in, in clever and interactive ways, and to think around perhaps some of the innovation and digital approaches that we've been looking at today and beyond. I know we're certainly thinking around uh, how, you know, what does using space uh, look like? Can we use virtual reality? Can we use different ways to connect um, different people and family members from different places and, and spaces as well into that, in that space? So I think it's really thinking around environment is really, 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 really important, isn't it? Both in terms of that kind of virtual environment, but as well as that kind of physical uh, presence as well. So I think, uh, Teresa, just thinking a little bit beyond burn down now, what's, what's your, your vision? You know, in, maybe fast forward 18 months or whatever, two years where the kind of family hub uh, network is more embedded in Dorset. What, 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 do you like to, what would you like that, that to look like from, from your perspective? Thank you. So we, you, you know that we have a really strong ambition for our children in Dorset, that they all thrive, that all of our children do well in the early years so that they're ready for school and that they achieve well when they're in school. We know that most of the children in our county have a fantastic life, but we also know that the gap in deprivation is significant. So we want to make sure that those children with disadvantage do just as well as others. Being able to access support with, the, with their family and on their own when and where they need it is going to be a key part of that. So I see no problem with having really special, warm, welcoming places for children to be able to get that support. We know, you know, I'm not going to break into song, but we know the children are our future. Investment in them, every pound spent in supporting a child to have a good life means that we're not seeing adults who are not great citizens. So we know investment in children, investment in early help is absolutely the right place to be. So that's why we're doing this with the Family Hubs model. We've been supported by the Department of Education with some funding to do this. That's because they believe in our Dorset model. They believe in our locality work and they believe in the way in which we're integrating ever more together so that families don't have to navigate all sorts of different people but can get help where they need it. I always say to staff, you know, our, our families are us and, and we are our families. I don't see me as any different to our families in Dorset. So I always ask people, how would you like to get your help when you need support, when you have a life situation that means that actually you, you have a need right now for some support? And for many people, that's quite a private activity. They want to do it in a particular way. Some people really gain and benefit from having that counselling online, having that opportunity to just check in with others to be able to get the support there and then. For others, they absolutely need it to be in person. You know, so lots of people, particularly again in the last couple of years, have made it very clear that they want to be face to face. They want to be with another person to really talk through their challenges and their needs. But lots and lots of our young people who have experienced anxiety in the last couple of years really benefit from being able to go online, speak and be with somebody who's largely faceless, and be able to think through together some te techniques, some really, really simple ways in which children who are experiencing anxiety 
or depression can think about things differently, talk to themselves differently. You know, that CBT training is so powerful and so deliverable online for so many of us. So I do just say to everybody, however you think you might like your help is the same as everybody else. And so for all of us, we know that's diverse and we know that it's different depending upon the circumstances. Absolutely. So thanks, Theresa. And, th and we really want to make sure that we get that right in our, in our Family Hub model. Uh, so there's a, a great opportunity um, for families in this community here uh, in Trickett's Cross and Fern Down and East Dorset to come and help us shape together, because it is a collaboration between uh, statutory partners and, and uh, community organisations and critically families in each community to, to shape that Family Hub model. So do come to the centre tomorrow, that's uh, Wednesday, uh, and there is a drop-in between 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. where we've just kind of got cake and tea and coffee, but actually just an opportunity to find out more about Family Hubs and critically for us to hear a little bit around your expectations and how you want that to look in this community. So do come and join us tomorrow. So thank you both. Really exciting. What an incredible opportunity. And I know, I know together we're going to really make the, the most of, of that opportunity. So we've got a question before we head into the next bit. So yes, someone shout a question at me and we'll do our best to answer it. Um, yeah, so, oh, that is loud. Um, yeah, we've got a question here. So are there any plans for the process that you've just described to be to happen in a virtual world, e.g. metaverse, VR, AR? Are there any plans for that to happen? Absolutely. And I think there's some really exciting uh, and yet fairly unexplored opportunities. The technology exists, but I'm not sure we've necessarily overcome some of the challenges, particularly around privacy and in that developer space. But yeah, we can certainly, um, uh, certainly imagine a situation where actually where we're working with a young person that we can go into their virtual environment. Often we expect people to come to us or even into their home. But actually, as we all know, um, uh, and I hope not just from our from our adolescent years, but even now, that we have a wonderful imagination and we see the world often through our own lens. Wouldn't it be a wonderful opportunity to bring other people, our families and those we're working with, into that space as well and to explore life through that? So I think VR has got a really interesting role to play. There's lots of, I say, traps to fall into on the way, but I think we're, we're, we're definitely cautiously but excitedly exploring what, what might be possible and how we deliver those through Family Hub. So definitely watch this space. Great, I think that's the last question on that, but do keep, oh, we, we've got one more question. Yeah, just one question, actually. On the virtual reality world, my concern is it could, that's the passenger could be Charlie as opposed to Coca-Cola. Um, the problem with the virtual world is that we could all end up just having virtual families, so we could end up having 10 members of our family, and then the human race would come to an end. But then the other point is, I had 10 virtual sons and daughters. Could I take benefits for them? Huh, so I'm not I would have heard the question, Teresa. So the question was around, um, the, I guess, one of the dangers of virtual reality is that we become perhaps disconnected from reality, and, and, and what does that look like? And uh, there was a, a, a great point in terms of what, when, how can we claim benefits if we were in the virtual world? Thank you. So um, a, a really serious part to your question, actually, which is around how do we keep real when we deal with each other online? And I feel very strongly about that in terms of safety as well. So there's something for me about we have to be really honest with our young people about sometimes you're not talking to the person that you think you're speaking to. So just gives me an opportunity, thank you for your question, to say actually it's also about keeping ourselves and our children really safe online. Um, and of course your virtual children wouldn't be virtual children, they would simply be meeting you virtually. So no, you couldn't claim benefits for them. It's really important, and that's exactly what we'll be mindful of. Before we do anything, safeguarding first. So everything we do is always about thinking about the safeguarding elements. Sometimes that slows us down a little bit, but I'm okay with that because it's absolutely about keeping ourselves safe. Thank you. Okay, so we are now going to be moving. So thank you, both of you. Uh, brilliant, uh, really exciting. Come tomorrow and find out more. We are now going to be heading inside the building uh, by someone pressing some clever virtual buttons. And we're going to be hanging out with Dan, who is talking to Phil and finding out where he's getting on with some stop motion animation. So check that out. Uh, yeah, they are by, by quite a far, far, far range, but, you know, I still have really high expectations of them anyway. 
what exactly got them doing the first place? So I've got them making a, a stop motion animation video. Uh, their goal is to make a 30 second video over the course of the next uh, hour or so. Uh, to do that, they need to take 60 separate images and we're gonna play them back to back really quickly and we have a video. Uh, at the moment, they have taken lots of pictures and as you can see, they've been really creative and fun with it. Um, and then after that, I'm going to ask them to start doing editing, including um, you know, adding sound effects and doing voiceovers and then most importantly at the end, adding credits to the video themselves as well. Uh, funnily enough, I realized just now I'm using iPad 2s, which were released in 2011. So these iPads are literally older than the children themselves. Um, and I think that's the kind of the, the whole point of this activity, where um, when we talk about educational technology and digital skills and that kind of thing, we can get you know really obsessed with like the highest, latest technology. But this is all about you know um, easily accessible, uh, affordable by everybody. Uh, uh, workshops and activities they can use uh, to, to do these kind of activities. So yeah, they are super basic iPads um, that are really, really old and an application that is free on the App Store. So, so you could even go home and continue with doing this, couldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Don't even need an internet connection as long as you have you know, plenty of toys and stationery and you know, mini pumpkins for kids to play with, you're fine. Could this lead into what's the next step after stop motion? Oh wow, that's a good question. Um, I think for some of them, I see some budding directors who will probably be taking ownership of the entire situation. I think some students are really, some of the kids are getting really into the kind of editing side of things. I think some of them would get really into the kind of sound production side of things as well. So yeah, I think it can lead to too many different pathways as well. So yeah, so there's some really excellent sort of opportunities after this, but I believe we've got some questions coming in as well now. This is one. Okay. Okay. So now we're going over to Anthony Littlechild, who's from the Council Sustainability Team. Hello. Um, well, Future Fest wouldn't be complete without uh, talking about the future of travel a little bit more. We've already talked about uh, walking and cycling, but 40% of our carbon footprint for the county comes from the way that people and products move around. Um, and a lot of that travel is done by cars. So currently, only about one in four cars that we buy as a, as a plug or as an electric vehicle. But by 2030, we're going uh, to stop the sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles, and by 2030 we're estimating, or the government's estimating, that about a third of the cars on the road will be electric. So that presents us with a bit of a challenge, uh, which is how on earth are we going to charge all of these vehicles? And I have uh, Chris Whitehouse here with me today, who's leading on our electric vehicle charging project. So Chris, what's the answer? You're absolutely right, saying it's a big challenge. Uh, around about a third of households don't actually have any off-street parking. So it does pose that question, where are they going to charge their electric vehicles? Um, and so what we're doing is we're putting in public charge points around the county. So we've around uh, already got around 30 charge points that we've put in uh, around, around the county. Those are in the main towns in, in Dorset. Uh, but we're also uh, now in, an, in a second phase that means we're going to put in an, about another 40 uh, charge points. Some of those include uh, what they call ultra rapids. So these, uh, these are really powerful chargers that can actually give you about uh, 100 miles in 10 minutes. So the time it takes to make a cup of coffee. Uh, so uh, yeah, lots of work going on and we've got big plans beyond that. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. So, so you mentioned that um, obviously we're going to put lots of chargers in towns. But what about the uh, rural areas? It's not just about towns, is it? Yeah, so that's that's our next phase. Um, we've got uh, we've been lucky enough to be selected as a pilot site for uh, the government's local electric vehicle infrastructure funding. Sounds very grand. Uh, and what it actually means is uh, lots of money to invest 
in charge points around the county, and the plan is to put those into um, uh, into into the, the smaller places, so the villages and and uh, and and smaller settlements. Uh, where people still need to uh, get access. The whole point of this is to encourage people to uh, uh, s switch to electric vehicles. And, that, and that's going to be really key for reducing our carbon footprint. Fantastic. Okay, Chris, so can you tell us a bit about how these things work? Surely there's got to be a bit of tech involved. Yeah, there certainly is. Uh, well, most of the charge points uh, will operate uh, just using a phone app. Um, and they're great because you can tell when your car's uh, finished charging, so you don't have to hang around for ages. Um, it'll also uh, tell you how much you, uh, it, it's going to cost you to charge, of course. Uh, very important. It's not free electric. Um, but also, um, it'll tell you uh, when the charge point's available. And so, you know, pr pretty key to, to all of this. And the cars themselves are very, uh, very, uh, very tech uh, orientated. They've got some uh, the good, good, good technology that will, you know, and the, and the, and the technology is evolving all the time. Uh, batteries are getting better. People now are talking about uh, solid state batteries, which are going to give you twice the uh, twice the range of current electric vehicles, and uh, and also um, be, a, you know, they'll start coming down in price as well. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, and how long do these sort of vehicles take to charge up. It's obviously not as quick as filling up with petrol. That's right. Um, it depends. It depends on how empty your, your tank is, um, so to speak, or your battery. Uh, but also, it's, uh, I mean, if, if you use one of our fast chargers, uh, which are the, um, I, I guess, the, the, the slower ones, uh, also actually uh, the, the cheaper way of charging, uh, you park up, uh, perhaps leave your vehicle overnight, but they'll, they'll They'll fill up a, a battery from empty uh, in about two to four hours, depending on how, how empty it is. But those ultra rapids, um, yeah, like I say, sort of 10 minutes to fill up. And they're even talking about, uh, you know, 350 kilowatt uh, super duper um, sort of charges that, you know, they, they will be able to fill up your vehicle in almost the same time as it takes to uh, fill, a, uh, fill a petrol or diesel car. So all that, all that's coming. It's a very exciting world, very exciting future uh, with electric vehicles. Thanks, Chris. That's uh, that's great. I've just got one final question to ask you because I, I I know for a fact that you work in Dorchester, and we're in Ferndown, which is a fair way across the county. So how did you get here today? Well, as you might expect, I did get actually, did come here in an electric car. Um, and the other thing I want to add is that, well, there were three of us in there, so that helped cut the uh, carbon footprint even more. Uh, big advocate of uh, car sharing. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, so I've had a question, Chris, which is, uh, are there any plans for driverless vehicles? Well, it'll be very exciting when there is. Um, it's that's still very new technology. Uh, you know, those driverless vehicles will be running on electric. That's one thing that's for sure. So, uh, however the technology, however they get charged, uh, we need to be prepared for that. But you know, I think it's a little way off yet. The the uh, self-driving uh, cars. Brilliant. Thank you. Council. How's Dorset Council, uh, Council currently approaching the bus service improvement program, uh, program for, um, for well, essentially, uh, for, for public transportation? So how, how, how is that being pro um, broached at the moment? Brilliant, thank you. I don't know if you're able to answer that question, Chris. Yeah, it's not, it's not an area of my expertise, but um, yeah, clearly public transport is, is um, a, it's something that's, you know, a very positive uh, way of uh, addressing uh, the carb carbon footprint. But yeah, it, it it does present a challenge in Dorset, um, and and I know that there is work 
that, you know, being done to, to look into how we can improve bus services uh, and other forms of public transport. But I'm afraid I don't know all the details of that. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Chris. And thank you for the questions. I'll pass over to Amy. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm back in this room with um, Lindsay and Catherine, who is from Digital Unite. Would you like to tell us about Digital Unite, please? Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, Digital Unite is an award-winning social enterprise. We've been providing digital skills support since 1996. We work with hundreds of organizations around the UK, including many local authorities, and um, we're the only organization that specializes in digital champion training and support. That's brilliant. I think we've got a video from your CEO, Emma Weston, haven't we? Um, should we? Hi everyone, I'm Emma from Digital Unite and I just wanted to send you a message about digital inclusion and to celebrate all the great work you're doing in Dorset to make an impact on the numbers and include more people in the digital world. Um, I have been running Digital Unite for 25 odd years, which is quite a long time. Everyone them a pleasure, obviously, um, but that's just to tell you that digital inclusion has been an issue um, for as long as I've been working. So that's how do we include everyone in the digital world, that they have the skills and understanding to make the most of uh, things that most of us who uh, have digital skills take for granted. So shopping, banking, being in touch with friends and family, accessing health information, taking part, finding stuff out, being included. Um, you might not want to, and choice is always an option, but not being able to do these things digitally is increasingly um, an impediment. As we enter an autumn of uh, cost of living crisis, having come out of, we think, uh, the COVID years, the need to have digital skills and transact with the world digitally has become more important than ever. A lot of services that weren't online moved online during COVID and that, um, that, that service move has continued apace. So it's really important that people like you and people like us continue to work uh, as creatively as we can to make uh, that world accessible to as many people as possible. There are 20.5 million people in the UK, um, current, current stats, um, who have low digital skills or confidence, and that is a pretty big number. There are 11 million people in the UK, adults in the UK, who do not have good enough digital skills for work. That is also a very big number. So there is still work to do. At Digital Unite, we believe passionately in digital champion models as the only way of really um, giving skills and giving confidence to people who don't have those through trusted intermediaries. And what I mean by that is people who are not going to patronise them, who are going to talk to them in their own language, who are going to support them according to their needs. And digital champions don't have to be technical experts, they just have to be people who've got time, patience, big ears, um, and can listen to the needs of people who are new to technology and who may be uh, anxious, who may be lacking in confidence, it's a very, a very big one. The other thing about digital champion models is they can scale because almost everyone who becomes a digital champion actually gets something really fundamentally beneficial out of that. They enjoy helping other people, they get something back from having helped other people. If we can all become digital champions, if we can support the growth of digital champions in our organisations, be they charities, be they businesses, be they small community groups, we have a chance of making a proper uh, impact on those big numbers. We've been really impressed by the work that's been done in Dorset over the years by your vibrant digital inclusion network, by the way you've knitted together the efforts uh, across the sectors, housing, community sector, small voluntary organisation, libraries. It's a really great flourishing ecosystem. And we look forward to seeing what you're going to keep doing with that network. Digital Unite is always here for you, to support you, 
with training resources for those champions, for the end learners, and to share something of the 25 years of experience we've got and we've had. So have a great day and looking forward to seeing what else happens digitally in Dorset. Bye. Great video and great to hear about all the brilliant work you're doing. Um, so whenever we hear about digital exclusion, there's always a big emphasis on digital champions. Can you explain why digital champions seem everyone's favourite way of helping the offline community get to grips with digital? Thank you, Amy. Happily, yes. Um, the main reason why um, we in Dorset, and I know Digital Unite, advocate the idea of using digital champions as a model is because it's about um, individuals and it's about people and the way they want to learn. So um, there are so many different reasons why people might have barriers to learning things digitally. Those barriers could be their skills, but the skills you need depend very much on what it is you want to do. So those skills are different for each individual person. The barrier could be that someone doesn't have a device, but the reason they might not have a device could be uh, a mixture of finance, fear, or motivation. There could be loads of reasons why they don't have a device. Or it could be that they don't have connectivity when the, where they live, or it could be a mixture of all of those. So the barriers that people face are really different for each individual. So the way that we can help them has to also be different for each individual. So the joy of the digital champion model is that you are working with someone face-to-face -face on an individual basis. So our digital champions can really help people look at what those problems are for them and address those problems. When we train our digital champions, we suggest to them that they look for the hook. And by that, we mean what is it that is going to be the one thing that's really going to make a difference to this person, that's going to intrigue them, that's going to excite them about digital. And it can be any manner of things, but it is always different for each individual person. So that is really why we um, love the digital champion model. And as Emma was saying on her video, you can scale it. So it's, it's a combination of those things. Amazing. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, we're going to hear a bit more about what's available to Dorset people get online in just a bit. But meanwhile, we're going back outside to the terrace, so we're going to go over there. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, yeah, so I, ha I have the pleasure of uh, being what's called the elected member, the councillor with responsibility for children and education on Dorset Council. That's a bit complicated, so what does that actually mean? Okay, so across the Dorset area, we have you know, circa 150 schools, uh, and all of those will have some input and engagement with Dorset Council and the services we provide, and we have certain responsibilities to meet in terms of how we support those schools in delivering education. Uh, now, inside the forum of the council, there has to be an elected councillor who is appointed to oversee children and education, and that happens to be me, for, which is just the most marvellous role to have on a council. Yeah, that really sounds great. Um, did you actually know we're in the middle of Europe Code Week as well? And it's from, I think, the 3rd of October to about the 23rd, so a lot more than a week in the end. What, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, absolutely, um, and I know that'll be a hot topic around the schools at the moment and the colleges, but actually we, we, we actually started this process last month, or actually back in September, when we uh, had the Dorset Day of Coding, and that involved something like 2,000 students and pupils across Dorset and across a great number of schools, um, and it was a fantastic event. It was, for many, it was probably their first opportunity to really start understanding coding and the importance of it and the work that they're going to be doing going forward. Yeah, I was actually involved in that at Gillingham Library myself. Um, it was a really excellent opportunity for our homeschoolers to get into coding and try something that they wouldn't get the opportunity to without being in a school necessarily. 
I uh, had two sessions and it was really great to see them enjoying it as much as they did. And it was all thanks to some really excellent planning and volunteers. Thank you. And just, I think what would be really helpful at this point is if we give everybody a feel of what that day actually looked like. And I think we've got a short video to run on that. Uh, today, we have been creating a, a fabulous coding project using the EduBlocks platform uh, for Dorset Coding Day, uh, where we've been uh, streaming our coding session across the whole of Dorset County into classrooms all over. Hey, I'm Josh. Uh, I work at TalkThinkDo. Um, I'm a front-end web developer there. Um, and we yeah, make websites for all sorts of different clients. It's great helping the kids uh, get used to um, yeah, using programs and, and building them and uh, knowing how, to, how their changes they can do here can you know, build things for the future. Uh, digital is a great thing to do for a career because you, um, it gives you real flexibility, you can work all over the world, it means you can change the way people work in their day-to-day -day lives and you can reach thousands of people um, every single day. Dorset Coding Day came around as a result of recognising how many of our brilliant local businesses are struggling to recruit and the importance for every type of job role for skills in understanding digital. We decided that we wanted to inspire young people by introducing them to those who are already involved in tech and digital and to relate that to an activity that was accessible for them. So I reached out to Barclays Digital Eagles and connected up with those and they designed an activity specifically for us. The activity today in the classroom, seeing our young people participating, engaging and relating to how what they're doing in the classroom is a real skill for life. So really exciting to have been active in classrooms from Lyra Regis right through to Christchurch and bridging BCP Council and Dorset. It's been really good today. We've had just under two and a half thousand children join in our coding sessions across the whole of Dorset. Okay, back to the studio. And welcome back. And I've been joined by David Gunnell from Talk, Think, Do, who are, of course, our sponsors. A very warm welcome to you, David. Well, that's very kind of you. Thanks very much. It's, it's great to be here and see all the enthusiasm going around the place. So just talk a little, a little bit about what it is Talk, Think, Do and how you're supporting that whole connectivity part that we're, we're really discussing this week. Uh, so Talk, Think, Do is a practice of uh, software developers and architects and uh, we heard about it through social media and thought this is a great local event that we want to be involved with. So about three or four of our developers went out into the different schools and communities and worked with the kids showing them you know, how coding works and actually they were really impressed with how already from a young age they've got that foundation of learning in place that our team didn't pick up until they're actually at university. So it goes to show the advancements are being made, and it's looking good. Sure. So some, something like Dorset Council's investment in uh, specialist uh, uh, facilities for T qualifications, which is actually happening in bricks and mortar here in Ferndown, with additional facilities at Ferndown Upper School, that will allow students to really develop uh, a, a great sense of the importance of coding and how that feeds into the greater technologies that they will use across a range of industries. And that's the thing, I think uh, we're all advocates of technology, obviously, but a bit like finance, you can then work in any vertical that you want. If you want to go off and work in Formula One because that's your thing, or if you want to stay in education, technology is very portable as a skill and an international need. So right now there is a shortage and everything being done by the council now and by the teams getting involved is helping uh, bring that shortage up and reduce the deficit that we have. So it's great for children to be involved at this time. When it comes to confidence around technology, now we see in things like, you know, in the nursery schools behind us and those sorts of locations, the use of things such as iPads from a very young age, building that confidence early. But what about the top end? What about the silver surfers? How, how do we make them more connected and involved with really a, 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 making the most of the technologies available? 
Well, that's a really good question. I think uh, during the pandemic, we saw as people were potentially struggling with challenges around isolation, things like Zoom, Teams, Facebook, all of those things using technology helped older people get connected. So now they've gained confidence and they're learning how to do online banking and those other things that are, are really useful for them, uh, but they still need support. So again, the agencies and avenues that we're seeing today being put into effect to help those people is really valuable. So facilities such as uh, the centre here, but also things such as the library network across Dorset are very important in delivering that, in your opinion. Um, what sort of things would, should people be looking for when they go into those, uh, those centres? Who, who would be, the, do you think, should be on hand to assist them? Uh, is it a virtual world, or would you expect them to have somebody who could point them in the right direction? I think, like all things, we all learn very differently. And so to avoid any exclusivity, you really want a hybrid version. Some people can cope really well with online, others need face-to-face, -face, others need to be shown how things work. So the more of a mix, the better. Personally, at my age, being shown how to do things is really helpful. Uh, younger people can cope really well with just uh, a pure digital environment. So a mix, I think, is ideal. Okay. So is the message really you're never too old to learn about coding? Is this something we should be rolling out across our, our programs for all age groups? I think so. Obviously, coding is at the top end, but in technology, you need people from all age groups. So, for example, in terms of usability, they, you need input from people who've got real-life experience, um, but also different skill sets. So it doesn't have to be just purely coding and tech. There can be management, uh, creativity, other skill sets come into play to make successful digital projects. Thank you very much. That was some really interesting stuff going on there, guys. And so that was some really interesting things you were saying there, guys. And I don't know, we might have some opportunity for some questions from the audience once again. We, so audience, do you have any questions for these guys since they're here and filled with so much knowledge? Any questions? Any questions? No, that's all right then. Well, I will be off and passing over to Amy, who I believe is with Lindsay and Catherine in the other room now. I'll see you there. Okay. Now. Hello. So, uh, we are going to talk a little bit about champions, aren't we? Um, what do they normally help with? Julie's going to tell us what sort of things she often gets up. Uh, yeah, I think, as I said at the very beginning of the day, we get sort of the whole range of people's different learning skills. Um, I do get asked uh, the, sort of the very basics, someone who perhaps has sadly lost their partner, who's done all the computer work, um, and they want to learn. Uh, so one of the things that we do is offer them uh, Learn My Way. It's a, a free online uh, course, and they can access those with the library computers, uh, or they can do it at home if they've got devices at home. Um, I also, uh, what, one of the things that we've um, uh, 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 been involved in is people who are interested in doing their family history research as well. So uh, a, a one gentleman came in, we were able to locate where his grandfather had lived uh, in the local village so he could go and visit the house. So there's quite a, a, a variety of things that we do. That sounds really interesting. What's the strangest thing you've been asked? Hmm. <laughs> that's that, that's a, a, a really difficult one because uh, some of, the, some of the, 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 the strange things are where perhaps people don't quite understand um, how technology works. Uh, so I did have to explain to someone the difference between a, a search engine and a browser. Um, and then you try and explain that there are different browsers and different search engines. Well, when you see their eyes glaze over, that's when you know that you need to say, come back and see and book another session. And they can come back as many times as they want to until, until they feel more confident um, and then come back periodically when they have questions. Thanks, Julie. It sounds like you're doing some great work across Dorset, helping people get up to speed with all sorts of digital communications and devices. Um, 
fact, as well as helping with digital skills, you've been helping people get online in other ways too, haven't you? I think you've been giving out some devices. Um, we have. We've, through the pandemic, worked with a charity called Good Things Foundation, and they gave us devices to give out to people who were socially ex um, excluded by the pandemic. And so we had uh, 60 tablets and 20 smartphones, and we gave those out to people who were housebound. We worked with a group who had learning disabilities, and they received tablets, and then the support to use them and our digital to help them show how to use them. We were then able to continue that project because we had COVID recovery money. So we used the money uh, to buy 94 devices that were a mixture of tablets and laptops that we've been giving out to digitally excluded people. We're just finishing that project now. And then we're going to go back to them in six months' time and find out how they've been using the devices and how that's uh, changed their lives hopefully for the better. Um, and then uh, we've managed to uh, find out that within the council, they recycle their devices, they get money back for recycling their devices, and we are going to be using that money going forward to buy even more uh, devices, which is obviously a lovely sort of circle, and those we get to hand out to digitally excluded people. We're still in the planning process of that at the moment, so it is very much watch this space, but we hope to be going out to the public and saying, if you are digitally excluded and a device will make the difference to you, come and talk to us and we can see whether we can give you one. And Thanks, Lindsay. It sounds like you've really made a huge impact across the, the time of the pandemic and you're continuing to do so, which is really, really great. Um, there's lots of help for people who want to improve their skills in Dorset libraries, isn't there, Daniel? There certainly is. As you've already heard, lots of our digital champions, they're in there many days of the week giving out advice to people who need it. But we've also got free Wi-Fi of our own and public computers, so maybe you are able to get online, but you don't have a device of your own. And even you can get your books online 24-7 with our, our e-services like Libby and BorrowBox. And generally, we just believe that it's an excellent way to enable and improve people's lives. And we've been trying to get our kids in as well with like the coding day and now starting up code clubs in places like Dorchester, Weymouth, and even Gillingham. It's a, just really great to improve people's lives with digital. That's great to hear. Thanks, Daniel. I am going to turn around and ask Phil how the activity is going on with all of these kids. Uh, it's going really well. Grab this. Uh, yeah, going with, um, we have some epic movies waiting. I told them 30 seconds, but some of the students have these movies that are three minutes long now. Uh, director's cut versions of them. But yeah, it's gone really well. The students, the, the kids have really enjoyed it, I think. I think they've learned a lot. And they've been, you know, engaged enthusiastically the entire time. Uh, so now we're just putting the finishing touches of, you know, sound effects and music and that kind of thing. That's great. It's great to hear that not only have they far exceeded your 30 second time, time frame, they've gone to three minutes. Um, we're going to go back outside to, over to Anthony and Teresa who want to tell us about the solar panels on the roof. Turn the mic on as well and then you can hear me. <laughs> so thanks, Amy. I will talk about the solar panels on the roof. They are part of a, um, a huge grant scheme, which the, the, the Dorset Council managed to get £19 million from the government a, a year or so ago uh, as part of the government's public sector decarbonisation scheme. So the government was giving money to public sector organisations uh, to help them to reduce their carbon footprint from the energy that they use in their buildings, which if you think of the whole public estate is enormous. Um, so the council managed to secure 19 million pounds, which was actually about the third biggest uh, grant award in the country. And our sustainable property team have been really hard at work trying to get this project delivered uh, in a very, very short time indeed. 
Now, £19 million is quite a lot of money, and it's enabled us to do hundreds of different uh, decarbonisation projects. Uh, we've managed to do projects on over 200 of the buildings that Dorset Council owns, including this one. Uh, and we've managed to do things on schools, offices, our depots, libraries, even country parks. Uh, and we've been able to, through the grant scheme, uh, install a range of things uh, from things to try and reduce our energy use in the building, such as increasing the levels of insulation, uh, in, uh, putting in place lots of uh, LED lighting, replacing some windows. So we've got a big project at County Hall at the moment, replacing windows with new double glazed windows, uh, heating controls, and even the use of uh, low carbon technologies, such as the solar panels on this roof. So solar panels and heat pumps. So just to talk about this building a little bit, um, so this building, you can't see them, but it's quite covered in solar panels. It's got 166 solar panels on the roof, which is uh, about 45 kilowatts of solar. Roughly speaking, about enough for 11 or more houses. Um, it's also got a state-of-the-art uh, building management system, which is basically a, um, a piece of tech to help the building to manage the heating system to ensure that the, the uh, energy used for heating uh, is is used efficiently. Heating system uh, fits what the people in the buildings need, and that built, we've had that sort of system in place at the county, uh, the council now for for many years. But they've all become quite quite elderly. Um, but the systems that were in place have managed us to us to save about twenty percent across the across the whole estate on energy, uh, just from managing the heating controls effectively, um, and has actually uh, enabled all of Dorset Council's schools to be counted as the uh, most energy efficient schools in the, uh, in the country. So the new systems that are being put in, in over 200 buildings, uh, is, a, is a new piece of tech. It's upgrading the old systems, uh, making it future-proof, making it web-based, much more interactive, and enabling everybody to, to use the system uh, much better. Um, but the project on this building is a, is a sort of baby in comparison to the overall scheme. Um, and uh, we've been trying to sort of maximise the amount of solar that could be put onto the buildings with that £19 million. So a whole range of different measures, all those other things I talked about, but solar being one of the key things. Um, so in all, we're looking at about six megawatts-ish of solar across a whole estate. Lots and lots of that on schools. And in fact, one of the largest projects is on uh, Ferndown Upper School, which is not very far from here, don't know which way. Um, uh, and that has a system which is 360 kilowatts on nearly 1,000 panels, about 914 solar panels, I think. Also has a new energy management system and uh, roof insulation. The great thing about the schools projects in particular uh, is obviously it helps the schools to try and meet their net zero goal, their carbon reduction commitments. And a lot of schools have now sort of uh, pledged to get their carbon emissions to zero helps them to cut their bills, which we all know are sort of growing, and it has a huge educational benefit. So a lot of the solar panels you can see, but also some of the schools uh, previously have had, had sort of systems in place which enable students to be able to see how much energy is being produced uh, and um, you know, linked in with other educational programs. You can use some of that information in the curriculum and so on. So overall, uh, very effective. Uh, project's still ongoing overall but nearly completed, and by December it should all be hopefully signed off. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anthony. It sounds like you've been uh, incredibly busy, and um, I, it's so sunny here today. I think we're probably generating all those three megawatts of power in Dorset today. So, absolutely, when the sun shines, we're doing good stuff. Right, I'm going to ask a few of the, uh, the, uh, the protagonists that have joined me this morning to, to come up. Uh, here's a microphone. Thank you. Do you come along. Can you believe it? We are almost out of time today uh, for day two of Festival of the Future. It has been, I think, a really, really fantastic uh, day. I hope you guys have really um, had some, some insight, learned some stuff, um, and really kind of uh, joining us in our excitement of what really, not in the future, but actually uh, the digital reality and in, in, in living and working in Dorset is like, um, and what an exciting thing that is and of course we've got more to explore as the week goes on but I want to extend a huge thank you to Nikki and your team for for welcoming us here to the centre at Trickett's Cross it's been really fantastic.
Thank you. I'd like to thank um, everybody who's been watching online in your home or in the office and just say that um, it's amazing the innovation that's actually happening on our doorstep. If anyone has any questions regarding the centre or want any support, please just come along, have a coffee and a chat, and we'll see what we can do. Thank you. Uh, we'd also like to say thanks to all the young families and parents that came along. It's been really great to see you all here and getting involved with our digital stuff. Fabulous. A great day, great weather, and hoping that it will hold for tomorrow when we're at the Dorset Innovation Park in Winfrith. Thank you. So, when you woke up this morning, I can guarantee the first thing you didn't think about was, I'd like to watch a video of solar panels. But I'm assured that the video we're going to show you now is very beautiful. And, and, and Anthony talked a little bit about those 914 panels. So come and fly through the sky of Ferndown and, uh, and see what uh, 914 solar panels can really do. It's been lovely to see you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>